Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. When we discussed the fathers of the late 4th century, we spoke often of the declining significance of the city of Rome. Once it was the administrative center of a vast empire, now the empire was unwieldy and better served by the eastern capital, established by Constantine. Geography and topography made Rome inconvenient and vulnerable, and so the Western imperial courts moved elsewhere, first to Milan and then to Ravenna. The Eternal City was left with its glorious monuments and its Senate, which was largely honorific and had long since been relieved of any real power. Rome was not yet a ruin, but by the year 410 it was already treated like a museum or a shrine. The city remained a symbol of Roman achievement, civilization, world culture, world order. Thus, in 410, when Alaric sacked Rome with his army of Goths, distant lands felt the shock. In Palestine, Jerome experienced the event as a trauma. Yet Rome would be breached again and again in the century ahead. Even as a symbol, Rome was badly weakened. And yet, in the middle years of the 5th century, there came a pope who spoke with an unprecedented boldness about the primacy of the Roman Church and the unique authority of its bishop. His name was Leo, and he is one of only two popes whom tradition has honored as the Great. The esteemed petrologist Fulbert Carré, without hesitation or qualification, calls Leo the greatest pope in Christian antiquity, surpassed not even by St. Gregory, who is the other pope, to bear the title great. Leo was born probably in the last years of the 4th century. We know almost nothing about his early life. He first appears in the historical record as a deacon in the city of Rome. He was likely ordained around the year 430. Deacon was an office much revered there, and Rome limited itself to seven deacons, following the model of Jerusalem and the Acts of the Apostles, and each of the Roman deacons served the local church in some important, usually administrative, capacity. In the year 418, St. Augustine mentions receiving a message by the hand of a papal emissary named Leo. The young man bore the Holy Father's judgment regarding Augustine's controversies with the troublesome monk Pelagius. If that was indeed our Leo, he must have been a rising star in the Roman church. At the time of the Nestorian controversy, he emerges again from obscurity, and again he appears as the broker between the Pope and a great churchman. This time Leo arranged for John Cashin to compose a brief on the problems with Nestorius's Christology. Cashin, in dedicating his book to Leo, praised his friend and patron. He wrote, You have overcome my determination and purpose by your commendable earnestness and most urgent affection, my dear Leo, my esteemed and highly regarded friend, ornament that you are of the Roman Church and sacred ministry. Well, in the Christian Empire, there had never been bright lines or walls of separation between church and state, and churchmen were sometimes pressed into service for civic functions. In the year 439, the imperial regent, Gala Placidia, sent the deacon Leo on a diplomatic mission to Gaul as her representative. It was a delicate matter. Two powerful Roman generals were feuding, and their conflicts seemed to be escalating toward a crisis. The regent was concerned for the unity of the empire and for the army's strength against encroaching enemies. That Gala Placidia chose Leo for this task tells us much about the respect he had earned in the wide Roman world. And this is very useful for us, since it's really all we have to go on. Leo never acquired the habit 
of writing about Leo. Everything we know about his young life is what we glean from his acts of service and friendship, which were reported by others and not by Leo himself. The mission in Gaul dragged on. Leo had been there for months when he learned of the death of his bishop, Pope Sixtus III. In the same communique, he learned that he himself had been unanimously chosen as Sixtus's successor. Modern Christians might be surprised to hear of a deacon's election to the papacy, but in the early church it was quite common. Indeed, it was expected. Of the 37 men elected pope between 432 and 684, the vast majority were chosen from the ranks of the diaconate. In fact, only three of those 37 are known to have been ordained to priesthood before their election to the papacy. Three out of 37. So Deacon Leo returned to Rome, and on September 29th in the year 440, he was crowned successor of Sixtus and successor of St. Peter. He knew it wasn't going to be easy. He had played important advisory roles in the handling of the Pelagian and Nestorian heresies, so he had a keen sense of the difficulties the church was facing, and he had traveled widely, so he had seen firsthand that the empire was quickly crumbling at the edges. Before long, the Romans would abandon Britain to the Saxons so that the army could defend itself at other borders closer to the imperial capitals. He would face both threats from heretics and from barbarians with confidence and composure and remarkable success. Today we know Leo mostly from his sermons, of which almost a hundred have survived, and from his letters. His body of correspondence, more than 170 letters, is the largest collection of letters surviving from the time before Gregory the Great. They were preserved because so many were cited as authorities and precedents by later popes. The sermons and letters show that Leo was well-educated. He wrote with clarity and simplicity, the virtues most prized in classical Roman literature. But Leo never quoted the pagan classics. Even when he alluded once to Romulus and Remus, he didn't mention them by name. He brought up the Roman founders and their murderous conflict only to highlight the contrast with the Roman church's founders, Peter and Paul, and their brotherly concord. Leo's sermons were compact. They were practical, biblical, catechetical, and borne along by a sober eloquence. He followed the church's calendar and used the feasts to deliver messages about basic Christian doctrine. For Leo, Easter was the great center of the year, and all the other feasts, including Christmas, pointed to the Paschal mystery. He also preached regularly against error. He touched on the big heresies, of course, but also the common superstitions of ordinary people. He condemned, for example, the practice of horoscopes and other vestiges of the old Roman religion. Leo's work was pastoral. He was not at all given to speculative flights of theology, nor was he the kind of preacher who inserted himself into homilies. He was self-effacing in the extreme. Even though from 440 onward he was one of the world's most important public figures, we learn little of his personal life from his sermons and even his letters. Leo's life as Pope, like Leo's life before his pontificate, was not primarily about Leo. It was about Jesus Christ, as he was known from the scriptures and the life and liturgy of the church. One of his favorite themes was the authority of the office he held. From his earlier work, he knew the importance of papal authority in adjudicating doctrinal differences. The most successful heresies had succeeded by advancing arguments based on scripture. This was true of Arianism in the 4th century and Nestorianism in the 5th. Local councils of bishops considered the arguments, but often concluded with conflicting decisions. The bishops in one region might side with the heretic, while the bishops in the next region over cast their lot with the apostolic tradition. The buck had to stop somewhere, and Leo saw in both scripture and tradition that the place where it stopped was with the papacy. He asserted that authority confidently, and he acted upon it consistently and calmly. He spoke and acted as if he could be sure of God's protection. 
His principles and his confidence were soon and repeatedly put to the test. Word came from across the sea that the capital city was again divided along doctrinal lines. This time the problem came from one of the most forceful opponents of Nestorius. His name was Eutychus, and he was the head of an influential monastery in Constantinople. Ten years earlier, Nestorius had placed such a premium on the distinction between Christ's natures that he seemed to divide Jesus into two persons, one divine and one human. Eutychus ran in the opposite direction. In opposing Nestorius, he so emphasized the union of Christ's divine and human attributes that he erased their distinction. He taught that Christ had only one nature, a unique nature in which the human was swallowed up by the divine. Taken to its logical extreme, Eutychus's theology implied that Christ was not really human at all. And if he didn't share our nature, what did that mean for our salvation? The bishop of Constantinople, a man named Flavian, opposed Eutychus. But Eutychus had a powerful ally in the current bishop of Alexandria, Dioscorus. So once again, the Church of Constantinople found itself in an ecclesiastical war with the Church of Alexandria. Soon the whole Eastern Church was in an uproar. The emperor summoned a synod at Ephesus, but Bishop Flavian worried that the synod was rigged. Eutychus, meanwhile, wrote a letter of appeal to Leo in Rome, and Flavian did the same. Leo examined the appeals of both men and ruled overwhelmingly in favor of the bishop Flavian. He responded to Flavian with a long refutation of Eutychus, a document that history remembers as the Tome of Leo. It was a brilliant distillation of Catholic teaching on the nature of Christ. The Tome was Leo at his greatest. It was clear, compact, and precise. And the council never heard a word of it. Pope Leo's delegates brought his tome with them, but when the council convened in early 449, Dioscorus immediately took it over. He announced that Flavian would not be allowed to speak at all, and any bishop who objected would be opposed or sent to prison. He declared that Eutychus was Catholic. Anyone who raised objections to that judgment would go directly to jail. And then he announced that Flavian must be condemned and deposed. He would not allow Leo's letter to be read. When some of the bishops asked for at least a postponement, they found themselves surrounded by the pointy ends of swords. And when Flavian appealed to the Pope, he was suddenly surrounded by soldiers. Now there was utter chaos. Flavian tried to take hold of the altar, but the soldiers prevented him. In the brawl, he somehow found his way back to a room in the church where he could barricade himself in. Dioscorus posted guards to make sure that Flavian didn't get a message out to the Pope. But apparently someone had an attack of conscience, because we know about this riotous council, remembered in history by the name Leo gave it, the Robber Synod. Dioscorus pronounced Eutychus vindicated. Flavian died from the injuries he sustained at the Robber Synod. And Leo was silenced, but only for a moment. Leo wrote to the emperor demanding that he summon an ecumenical council. Leo wanted it to be held in Rome, with bishops from both east and west attending. He wanted assurance that the council would be governed by established rules of order. The emperor refused to call the bishops to Rome, but he otherwise complied with Leo's demand. He summoned the council to the city of Chalcedon in Bithynia, Asia Minor, for October of 451, and he pledged to keep it honest. More than 500 bishops attended or sent representatives. Without compulsion or coercion, the council fathers were able to hear the arguments and counter-arguments. Leo's tome, which had been suppressed at the robber synod, was read aloud in its entirety. The bishop's response was recorded in the minutes of the council. After the reading of the tome were told, the bishops cried out, Peter has spoken through Leo! So taught the apostles. Piously and truly did Leo teach. Anathema to him who does not so believe. This is the true faith. The Council of Chalcedon was the last of the great ecumenical councils on the nature of Christ. 
Leo's tome served afterward as a summary of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, as taught by the apostles and confirmed by the councils. Still today, the canons of Chalcedon and Leo's tome are considered fundamental touchstones of Orthodox Christology. But even as the council was underway, the empire was facing a most dire threat. The Huns, led by Attila, were sweeping through Europe, pillaging every city and town in their path. They seemed unstoppable. While the council fathers met in Chalcedon, the Huns were invading Gaul. From there, in 452, Attila's horde swept into Italy. It seemed as if nothing could stop him. The Huns completely depopulated whole sections of Italy. Cities were wiped off the earth, their populations dead or enslaved. With terrifying speed, the Huns were approaching Rome. Even the emperor was about to abandon Italy. So what could be done? This is where Leo stepped in. If armies could not stop the Huns, then only a greater power would do. Trusting in the protection of God, the Pope set out without an army to face the man known as the Scourge of God. Everyone was surprised when Attila received the Pope with honor and hospitality. Something about Leo impressed even the unstoppable conqueror. Attila met privately with the Pope, and something remarkable happened. At the end of their conversation, Attila simply agreed to leave Italy and make peace with the empire in return for an annual tribute. That's all. How did Leo do this? What exactly did he do? These are among history's great unanswered and unanswerable questions. We know that Attila and his numberless horde of Huns were on their way down the Italian peninsula toward Rome. We know that the Romans had no way of stopping them, and we know that after meeting with the Pope, Attila promised peace, turned around, and retreated back across the Danube. But why? Some historians think Attila might have had his own reasons for turning back. He might have been running low on supplies. His army might have been stretched to the limit in already ravaged Italy. Others suspect Leo might have played on Attila's well-known superstition. Maybe he reminded him of the barbarian Alaric. Alaric and the Goths sacked Rome in 410, and shortly after, the man dropped dead. Rome is protected. The one thing we do know is that Rome had run out of options. The only leader Rome could rely on was not her emperor, but her bishop, who was forced to take on the role of the government because there was no more effective government. So Leo, alone and undefended, accomplished what the best Roman generals and their hundreds of thousands of soldiers hadn't been able to do. Attila turned around and marched back across the Alps, headed back for his own empire. Three years later, Leo would assume the same role, now with the invading Vandal tribes and their king, Genseric. In 455, the Vandals marched toward Rome, and like the Huns before them, they seemed unstoppable. Once again, Leo went out and met with Genseric on his route to try to mitigate the sack that was now inevitable. Again, we do not know what Leo said or did. This time he was not able to turn the army back. But Genseric promised not to murder people in the city or destroy property. And so Leo arranged for the gates of Rome to be opened for him. The Vandals plundered Rome, stripping even gold leaf from the walls of buildings, and they took hostages from the families of the aristocracy. But they kept the promises they had made to Leo. Leo reigned for two full decades, and throughout that time, and in the centuries to follow, the church assumed an increasingly prominent role in secular affairs. By the time Leo died in 461, the Western Empire, once centered in Rome, had fallen apart. The state lacked the resources and the will to govern. Yet this was the moment when Leo spoke with new boldness about the unity of the church and the primacy of Rome. Rome had been reduced to a symbol, a tourist destination, a magnet for pilgrims. The days of its splendor and power were long gone. Leo's words should have seemed absurd to their hearers, but they didn't. They arrived as the words of Peter himself, and they still resound today. 
If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider making a contribution for the continuation of our series. The Way of the Fathers is listener-funded, so we're dependent on the generosity of people like you. Please pay us a visit at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio and leave us a note if you love the fathers. We pray for our benefactors every day. De quorum solemnitate gauden tangeli et collaudant filium de. Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, Listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.